The Canoe Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing. Hello and welcome to this very special edition of The Canoe Show from the ICF Canoe Slalom World Championships here in London. lots of race action, but that's only half of it, because we're celebrating 150 years since canoeing as we know it was born in the UK. I meet Britain's all-conquering para-canoe team, who could serve up a huge medal haul for us in Rio. And I immerse myself in the quieter side of Rio, with a canoe trail that's right next door. But first, we're all here because of the ICF Canoe Slalom and World Championships. So let's get down to business. British Canoeing and Lee Valley won the bid to host the World Championships back in 2011, and anticipation have been building ever since. The Olympic Games has the bigger public profile and is vital for national teams' funding. But for the athletes, the World Championships means tougher competition and in some respects, greater kudos. It all kicked off with the opening ceremony early in the week, followed by the heats, which all the British paddlers progressed through safely. As well as the World Championship glory being at stake, there were also Olympic places up for grabs, with teams having the opportunity to secure boat and athlete places for Rio. The Lee Valley venue was at its best, and there were lots of activities and exhibits to keep the capacity crowd happy all day long. Even the atrocious weather on the first couple of days couldn't suppress world's fever, and many let off steam in the Go Canoeing Ergo Tent. This being a World Championships, there were supporters and teams from nations far and wide, the Slovakian Supporters Club in particular were on very good form and brought a real buzz to the grandstand. Hopes for a repeat of that glorious Super Thursday at the London Olympics were dashed though, as David Florence and Rich Hounslow picked up two penalties and dropped from silver medal position down to fifth in the C2 final. One place above Etienne Stott and new partner Mark Proctor. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought about making the final, but um, each day we were taking it one step at a time. To get there, we were really happy and we gave it a really good shot in that final and I'm over the moon with our performance and the journey to get here is even more special actually. So I'm very proud of that journey, very proud of what we've done and there is still a little bit further to go and we'll fight for every moment we can. In the women's K1 final, things were looking very good for Kimberly Woods as she crossed the line with a time that would have given her a silver medal but after a controversial video review, she was given a 50-second penalty and dropped out of contention. Lizzie Neve and Fiona Penny placed seventh and ninth respectively, but on a tricky course, some really big international names were struggling too. Yeah, it's, it's always great to come back. My results have gotten a little bit worse each time. Second in London, third at the World Cup in 2014, and now fourth, but I do love this course. Fortunes changed for Jester the next day as she led the field home in the women's C1 race. And for Kimberly Woods, it was a better day in the office, finishing fourth. Ailey Gibson continued her strong progress since meddling at last year's Lee Valley World Cup with a fifth place, and Mallory Franklin took seventh. In the men's K1 class, there were high hopes for a medal, but none of our three paddlers managed to make it into the final. Joe Clark put in a semi-final run that would have given him a bronze medal in the final. But like Kimberly, he picked up a 50-second penalty, and that was that. Bradley Forbes Cryens was our highest placed athlete in 18th overall, with Richard Hauser one place behind. Redemption did come for the British team though, and it came in the form of David Florence and rising star Ryan Wesley in the C1 competition. Ryan was the first man down in the final and basically never stepped away from the leader's enclosure. He put in a strong time, but it was ultimately the fact that he went down clear that delivered him his first senior world championship medal, as faster paddlers made mistakes and picked up penalties, including the legendary Mikhail Martikan. David Florence was 7th out of 10 down the course and posted another strong clear run, and neither America's Casey Eichfield, Team Slovakia's hero Martikan, or winner of the semi-final, Benjamin Savsek, could knock him off the top spot. Uh, you know, winning the World Cup last year was absolutely awesome and 
I just desperately want to be able to repeat it at the World Championships when it's that, that massive stage. The support's been incredible, the weather's been good which has helped, you know, the spectators have, uh, you know, cheered all the British boats down so well and, uh, yeah, I just love being a part of this event, love getting to the final and having that chance to actually go for the medals and, and it went well for me today. I, I don't think it's quite sunk in yet what a World Championship medal is, that's sort of what you set out in your career to do and um, to have done it so early on in my career is so surreal. We might not have come away with the kind of medal haul we'd hoped for from a home World Champs, but the team secured all four Olympic places and we did also win medals in three out of the five team races. Given some of the personal performances and also the way in which our athletes conducted themselves in what was a really high pressurised environment, the health of British canoe slalom has never looked stronger ahead of the 2016 Rio Olympics. One of the best features at the Canoe Slalom World Championships for me is the McGregor exhibit, celebrating 150 years since the great man made his epic 1,000 mile journey in his Rob Roy canoe. Widely credited with giving birth to modern canoeing, it seems strange that John McGregor isn't more widely known. This was something the exhibition at Lee Valley sought to put right, with a celebration of McGregor's 150 year influence on the sport and some key milestones in British canoeing history. One of McGregor's actual Rob Roy canoes that he had built for his legendary expeditions was the centerpiece, along with a number of other historic wooden craft. Two weeks before the Worlds, there had been a gathering of wooden canoes and kayaks at the British Club Championships in Nottingham to celebrate the anniversary. And Piranha Kayaks founder Graham McKerrith, himself an avid boat collector, paddled one of only a few remaining original Rob Roy's in the parade. And despite the boat's age, she still cut a fine line through the water. Photographer Anthony Edmonds and I were lucky enough to be given access to McGregor's original expedition diaries, and they were simply fascinating. So he's, you know, he's finding out the problems of uh, getting a canoe, isn't he, down the, down the river. All the problems, portaging, all the issues that nobody's had before. Look at that, it's fantastic. Back at Lee Valley, the exhibition was attracting a lot of attention, with everyone captivated by the boats and McGregor's own story. As well as the historic wooden craft, there was a Cockleshell Heroes display with a massive Operation Frankton memorabilia. And there was also an original boat from the Everest Base Camp descent and a selection of competition craft through the ages. It's easy to overstate the significance of some sporting exhibitions. But in the case of this McGregor display, it's fair to say that canoeing's history really was fully laid out for all to see. Buoyancy Aid has come a long way since the old days, and now the big thing is personalisation. It's common to see canoe slalom paddlers with fully matching CAGs and buoyancy aids, and the brand leading the way with funky designs and patriotic team kit is the British firm Peak. So I caught up with their head honcho, Pete Astles, to get the full story on the custom print revolution. The custom print idea really came from the cycle industry. Um, back in, I think it was the 2000 Olympics, we did some uh, sampling. Uh, for this kind of technology, uh, utilising a cycle company to help us. Uh, but then for 2012 I wanted to do something really special for the London Olympics and I knew of the technology so we just basically invested some money. Uh, we actually built a new factory um, and planned in the production space to do this. We print uh, cut pieces of fabric uh, and then sew the garments, uh, finish the product ourselves uh, in the UK in our factory in Darleydale. At World Championships level, it's sort of uh, each nation can have a unique look for sure. But I think what's happening now as well is individuals, you know, away from the sort of international competition, individuals are developing their own look. And we have had quite a lot of sort of unique designs for you know certain athletes. Uh, they've come up with their own idea to, ma to match their boat in some instances. So I think the new GB designs, you know, really good. Uh, but we've done some interesting ones. We've done a Cookie Monster. Uh, I think we've refused to print a few things. So uh, yeah. Uh, Cookie Monster's pretty good. I'm with Pete. The Cookie Monster kit does it for me. So I persuaded him to lend it to me. All in the name of science, of course. 
Well, I fancied a run down the World Championship course, so I suppose you could call that an experiment. The Lee Valley course is certainly big and bouncy, and I know it's been 11 years since I won my Olympic medal, and you could say I'm a little out of practice, but the pace, volume and course design at this World Championships provides a big challenge. and then you're into four, five and six. It's quite an inconsistent part of the water where the wave changes a bit and it's quite a physical move. There were a number of key moves where the athletes needed to combine technical finesse and strength to ensure they didn't give anything away. What a move! Upstream gate 11, cross that big stopper into upstream gate 12, then back across the downstream. pretty but I have to admit I was buzzing when I got to the bottom of the course and pretty chuffed of negotiating most of the gates. There's no question that the Lee Valley Whitewater Centre has been a huge success since the London Olympic Games and in terms of legacy it's right up there leading the way. Well I think we've always had um, a really integrated approach and what we've tried to do is create a world-class facility but without the elitism you will have the British team training here every day um, twice a day and you can come and see that but you will have people coming for the very first time to jump on a paddleboard or a kayak on the lake um, for a very small fee um, and just enjoy paddle sport for the first time and getting that whole mix means that on a Saturday afternoon you could have the, the gold and silver medalists doing their training slot swiftly followed by uh, a stag group or a birthday party enjoying the rapids and with all their friends and family watching. It's been amazing and it's one of the few uh, venues of this kind that work after the Olympics. It just doesn't become a big white elephant. We've had over 150,000 people coming through here doing whitewater rafting, doing canoeing, doing kayaking, uh, going on the flat, going on the legacy course and going on the Olympic course. Having agreed that this would be the, uh, the, the best site with the stakeholders, then to work on the concept for the facility, which was really an athlete-focused um, process, understanding how the users of the building would um, you know, want to kind of achieve their desires and results, but also being absolutely kind of focused about kind of legacy users. I think it's just it's, it's worked out really, really well. It's a great, great place. One of our big pushes for next season is going to make sure that the British Open Championship for slalom actually becomes a British Open for all of the disciplines. We can take water polo out on the lake, which is great. We've had the wild water races um, down on the legacy course. We've had rafting competitions on the legacy and on the main course. Freestyle is really popular here and one of the reconfiguration points that we're going to try and make is get a really good feature for, for those guys to practice, train on, take out to their world championships, but also really enjoy it at a national level. So yeah, our key aim is to really cover all the disciplines and just give people a taste of four. They may not enjoy one discipline or they may think they, they um, are targeted towards one discipline, but actually there's so many different forms of canoeing they could try um, and here's a great place to try them. Britain excels at para canoeing, and we've got multiple world champions to prove it. With para canoe making its debut at the Rio Games, I went up to Nottingham to meet some of the athletes and to hear how things are going from programme manager Steve Harris. So we started out with um, the end in mind, what is it we wanted to achieve? Uh, how successful do we want to be um, at Rio? And then based on how successful we wanted to be, we then started the programme from, from there. So over a period of four years, we've, we've grown into what we are now, which is having a really world-class high-performance centre, 
four full-time coaches, sports science, equipment, uh, going to competitions uh, around the, the globe in order to um, propel us and put us on the right platform for a career. Now that I am full-time like UK sport athlete, it's just that next step and I feel that I'm in the right place to really push on. I'm the most confident I've ever been. I'm normally really nervous, really like just a bit apprehensive about my performance and what's going to happen. But this year I'm really confident that I'm going to be around you know, top four and on the day. Who knows? Um, I think sitting volleyball was my first experience of, of Paralympic sport. So to go to a home Paralympics was an incredible experience. Um, and it was after that that I thought, I really want to see what sort of level I can get to um, in an individual sport and in a sport that really takes performance um, as its main priority um, and the elite aspect of it really seriously. So I was lucky enough to find uh, Para Canoe um, and it's just kind of gone from strength to strength since then really. I rode previously at the, um, the London Paralympics, so I, I've sort of got a, a competitive sport background and um, I had a bit of a break, I've had a son in the meantime and, and had a couple of operations and was looking for something new and I took on a charity trip which involved a lot of kayaking and um, someone put me in touch with these guys here and it just sort of felt like a natural fit so it sort of went from there really. I was looking for something to put my energies into and, and kayak seemed like the, the perfect thing. One of the first things I did after after my accident when I was able was get back in the swimming pool in you know in a boat and, and see if I could still roll um, just as a, a bit of a target, something I could do before just to see where I was at really um, and I was quite surprised to see that with a lot of practice I could actually roll again um, and it's just getting back to normality isn't it? You don't really want uh, any sort of injury to affect you as much as it does it, you don't want it to change your life, you want to go back to normality and how you were before so anything you can come back to that you did before and do as well as or even better than you did before, it, it's just, it's kind of reassuring and it makes you forget about the injury and realise that, you know, it's not that different. Looking forward to Rio, we are going to be competing and uh, the rest of our team are going to be competing for the first ever Paracanoe medals in history. What an event. I believe with the structures we've got in place, with the athletes that we have on our programme, we're going to go to Rio and I'm not going to say that we're going to win lots of medals, but I believe we're going to do very well. Ever wondered how many people could fit in a Canadian canoe? No? Well, we did. It might seem like an odd quest, but these things matter to us at the Canoe Show. So, we set about recruiting guinea pigs to help us, and thankfully there were plenty of enthusiastic Go Canoeing staff on hand at the event, and they didn't take much persuading to mess about on the lake. <laughs> so, the $64,000 question, how many could we fit in before the canoe either sank or capsized? I'm thinking at least 25. I reckon we can get 15. Be realistic, 15. 25 yes. pieces, is it 25 people? Not currently, no, there's maybe about six. So here we go, how many people can we get in the canoe? They're starting with the largest, could be a good tactic, we'll have to wait and see. Oh, and another large man getting into the canoe. Oh, so they're going the men first, three men in the boat, can they do it? Yes, three accomplished. And here come the ladies. That is four now in the boat. Oh, they're trying to speed it up. Four, are we going to make five? We will have to see. Number six is going right at the front of the boat. Oh, we're going to try two on the front. Oh, it's looking balanced, it's looking okay. The wobbles are starting, you see the hands in the water. Oh, oh. So this is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Can we get number eight? We've done eight. Oh, it's eight, hey, and they're in. Okay, who said 25? If you've managed to fit more than eight people into a three-person Canadian canoe and you've got the video to prove it, why not send us a message with a link and we'll share it on the Canoe Show channel. No event like this would be complete without a VIP guest or two. 
and normally they wouldn't go anywhere near the water. But casualty actress Chelsea Healy had other plans. Chelsea was visiting the Whitewater Centre before the Worlds to promote the event and agreed to take a run down the Olympic course for the media. She looked quite at ease out on the lake and I did wonder if she knew what she was letting herself in for. But then she had previously paddled down the Zambezi as part of a star-studded comet relief challenge. Keep going forwards and stop. We fitted some GoPros to the rod and the instructor to capture the whole thing. And then retire to a safe distance to watch destiny take its course. think that was dramatic, this guy proves that even when everything goes pear-shaped, it's not inevitable that you're going for a swim. stressing me out. I need somewhere to relax. The stretch of the River Lee navigation we're looking at runs from the Lee Valley Boat Centre at Broxbourne all the way down through Lee Valley Park, past lakes and nature reserves to the White Water Centre. I decided to start at Broxbourne and head south, but you can just as easily go the other way or even paddle further upstream beyond Broxbourne. There's a large car park opposite the boat centre and a fairly easy put-in, although it should be stressed that the canal banks are quite high all the way along at the portages. So travelling in a group or a pair isn't a bad idea. There are quite a few interesting features to encounter along the canal, from bridges to weirs and old wartime defences. If you're lucky, there's a chance for a bit of hunting and gathering. All right, that's enough of that. Back to work. The canal is quite a vibrant place and popular with all sorts of towpath users, from runners to cyclists and walkers. Almost the whole length of this stretch of the canal has lakes and parks surrounding the route. So you're never far away from a nice place to stop for a break. Just north of the Lee Valley YHA, I stumbled across this orchid enclosure next to Chesant Lock, completely by chance. Despite it being quite late in the year, there were still a couple of solitary orchids giving it their best. And I can imagine that in May or June, this place would be a must-see stop-off along the route. South of Chesant Lock, you get into the Olympic zone, tracking the entrance route for the canoe slalom at the London Games. And then, within a few metres of the canal, is the Whitewater Centre itself. When you step into this part of the Lee Valley Country Park, you can really see why they call the area London's Green Artery. The River Lee itself, although not open for canoeing, is a fine piece of water. And all the parks and lakes really do make this spot a little oasis of calm in one of the busiest corners of the M25. Well, that's it for a fantastic Canoe Slada World Championships here at Lee Valley. The racing's been superb, but it's canoeing itself that's the real winner. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.
Canoe Show. It's brought to you in association with British Canoeing.